Shows made by thinking hard about our favorite magic cards. Four hours on MH2, jet left for medical school. Judge Bones on the phone, our mistakes are overblown. Deal broker brainstorm, cards on which Parnell is wrong. ABCs of aggro, context matters, don't you know? Service bell, buzzword, a cube that's completely gold from lockdown, mom town, bread and butter breakdown. One lost episode, Parker did not hit record. We didn't start the podcast, we were always talking, just began recording. We didn't start the podcast, and then he tried to fight it, now he kinda likes it. Mustard cleaver, soy sauce, lucky paper can't be bought. Ryan Sachs, Sam Black, guests have been completely stacked. Pack one, pick one, hundreds that we haven't done. Emma Partlow eating cheese, Anthony's roto spreadsheet. Hour on to brainstorm, intro that's a brain warm. Hired a barber shop quartet, hardly use them, I regret. Start a beef with LSV over cryptocurrency. FTX, buy some checks, what the heck did you expect? We didn't start the podcast. We were always talking, just began recording. We didn't start the podcast. And then he tried to fight it, now he kinda likes it. Listeners and lots to say, what is tempo anyway? Power creep, sacred cows, Parker troll by incels. White man lion's tail is long, and he wrote another song. Five color good stuff, and pronouncing canyon slough. Our friend Dominic Carby living in our head rent free. AI artists so crappy, do you remember NFTs? Legends wearing cowboy hats, Hasbro's counting up fat stacks. Shareholders are cutting costs, and those who made it get laid off. We didn't start the podcast, we were always talking, just began recording. We didn't start the podcast. And then he tried to fight it, now he kinda likes it Andy hating on Triumph, a famous fish with island home Uber Cube cracked a few, broke up with Collector Oop Talo and Donald K, help write notes without delay Focused on community, perfect songs by Kennedy Baltimore, Madison, Cali Champs, Boston Magic celebrates the fay, Andy Mackie misplays We didn't start the podcast We were always talking, just began recording We didn't start the podcast And then he tried to fight it, now he kinda likes it Monday Discord overflow, challenging the status quo Hundred ornithopters fly, Texas card, what's he why? Trade routes, Belcher, Philly magic con lecture Poster photos just like Joe, kill the pot, don't you know? Morrow, what have we become? Anthony has two thumbs, never once have we rehearsed Caustic Bronco is a horse Rent a van, bathroom ham, kill globe is a windmill slam Pony boy spooky poppy, do you follow we will see We didn't start the podcast, we were always talking just began recording We didn't start the podcast, but the magic's gone You will go on and on and on and on and on and on Inside the podcast, we were always talking, just began recording. We didn't start the podcast, and then he tried to fight it, now he kinda likes it. We didn't start the podcast, we were always talking, just began recording. We didn't start the podcast, and then he tried to fight it, now he kinda likes it. We didn't start the podcast. We were always talking, just began recording. We didn't start the podcast, and then he tried to fight it. Now he's got it like. Stop just being normal. Don't be normal. Stop being weird. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the 200th episode of. 
Lucky Paper Radio. It's actually like 208 or 9, but we had a lot of episodes we called bonus episodes in there that weren't canonical numbered episodes. But this is the 200th canonical episode of Lucky Paper Radio. I am Andy, and I'm here as always with my co-host, Anthony, a real infinite jest guy Maddox. Oh no, (laughs) we did it. Um, You do love it. Yeah, I don't want to be an infinite jest guy, but it is definitely one of my favorite books. I think it is It is just incredible. Where did the stereotype of the infinite jest guy come from? I mean, I think it's just it's just a wildly challenging book that for some reason got very popular for a while. Uh, and, you know, it's just sort of this, this thing that happened in this phenomenon where people have this copy of this really difficult book that... I don't know what's worse, if, if it's just sitting there never having been read, or if they have, in fact, actually read this extremely challenging book. I mean, that's not bad. You want them to read the extremely challenging I book, I so. assume. I don't know. But I feel like the, the cultural impression of the guy that has Infinite Jest on his bedside table and has barely read it but thinks it makes him look smart, that is like such a codified idea to me that I've like I've talked to multiple people about this idea. I feel mm-hmm. like it must have been like some character in a movie or TV show or something was like... No, I think it's just the book. <laughs> Hold up, wait. You have Infinite Jest on your bookshelf. That's Hillary's copy. Okay. My wife's an Infinite your Jest guy. Your wife's an Infinite <laughs> Jest guy. Okay, okay. Yeah, I've never tried to read it nor acquired it. I tried three times. And succeeded three For times. Thir- nope, the third time it took. <laughs> it took you three times to get there? Yeah. But it was worth it. I mean, worth it is hard to say. You said it's one of the best books of all time. That seems worth it. Yeah, very. I mean, if it's difficult. not worth it, that's a real indictment of all books. Okay, fine. It was worth it. <laughs> if it you're was like, worth it. it was great. One of the best books of all time wasn't I'm worth to think trying what, a couple times. What took me? What was more difficult to read, Infinite Jest or all of On Food and Cooking by Harold McGee? Different I, kinds of difficult. I feel like the more difficult thing for you to read was that smell book you were reading. That the took smell you book so took long. me so long because I was trying to follow along too close with all the chemistry, and I I went to art school. So organic chemistry is not necessarily my strong suit. As far as we get in art school is like, don't eat the heavy metal don't oil eat paints. The paint. <laughs> That's about as far as you get. <laughs> That's in less terms chemistry, of chemistry than biology, but oh, sure. Oh my god! Thank you for clarifying. You're welcome. I mean, what do you? You could do chemistry with heavy metals. It's very common. What do you? What do you mean? Sh- yes, of course. Yep. And in the end, it's all just physics, right? I'm thinking of that XKCD where yeah, it's but the it's applied like thing. abstract mathematics. Doesn't it go to math at the very end, right? I math think so. is the That's, most. That sounds familiar. The most abstract one. Anyway, for our 200th episode, we are, of course, going to run down our top 200 most powerful cards for Vintage Cube. We're going down all of them. People have asked for this for a long time. I'll start my number one with a bullet Ancestral Recall. What's your number one? Uh, 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 Soul Ring? Soul Ring better than Black Lotus? I don't know. I think there's a lot of things better than Black Lotus, personally. Maybe not a lot. There's a handful of things I think are better than Black Lotus. Probably some, like, initiative card. Well, I guess, I don't know, I guess the question Adventure. is, like, what's the legality here? Because, like, Contract from Below or mm-hmm. one of the oh, Companions yeah. actually, it's, or it's any of the conspiracies? Yeah, of the conspiracies, definitely. If yeah. we're actually counting those, yeah. I'm not sure if we are. I mean, we've been doing a couple of full vintage Roto drafts in the playgroup recently. And actually, I mean to have people that I've done these with onto the show sometime to discuss these because they've been really interesting. By which I mean a Roto draft, but you can pick any card from the entire vintage legal card pool, which is a little bit overwhelming and it's hard to keep track of what your options are because they're everything. But it's been really interesting to see the kinds of decks that come out of that and how they differ from decks that would be Roto drafted from just a vintage powered cube, which I think a lot of people would think, well, that contains the best cards in Magic already. Then you do a vintage Roto draft and you're like, people are taking Bajooka Bog pretty highly, and that card doesn't show up in any powered cube I've ever seen. So it's interesting how different the perspective is when you're actually just looking at the entire card pool. The meta totally shifts. Are people taking, like, Conspiracies and Volatile Chimera? Conspiracies are not vintage legal. So okay. no. We did have an issue where mm-hmm. Alex tried to take Arcane Savant. Tried to. And I said, well, hold on a minute. <laughs> I said, and it was like pick, I don't know, like it was like round 20 or 23 or something. And Alex is like Arcane Savant and Sublime Epiphany. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Cool hold on one a card combo. I'm like, we didn't talk about this. Technically, Arcane Savant is vintage legal because Arcane Savant refers to a card you drafted. And so you didn't draft any cards when you're playing Constructed. So it just doesn't function. It's a five mana three, three in vintage. I argued that if you could just cast any card out of your sideboard with it, that card would surely be banned in Vintage or restricted. Probably banned, honestly. It would be a huge mess. There's like so many things to just break with it. 
Uh, so we had to have a big discussion about whether or not we were going to let Alex do that. I won. Family he wasn't meeting. allowed to you do it. You won the family meeting? I did win the family meeting. That's kind of disappointing to me. I mean, five mana literally win the game is not a fun magic card. Yeah, but you didn't talk about it beforehand, so he should be allowed to do it. <laughs> I guess, but like, are we going to start roto-drafting Regicide and Paliano the High City and all these other cards that don't work in Constructed? Sure. Aether Searcher actually becomes like a very good tinker target because Aether Searcher does a kind of similar thing to Arcane Savant, but is a seven mana artifact. Hit us with the Aether Searcher rules text, Anthony. All right, Aether Searcher is a seven mana six four. Reveal it as you draft it and reveal the next card you draft and note its name. When Aether Searcher enters the battlefield, you may search your hand and or library for a card with the name noted as you drafted cards named Aether Searcher. You may cast it without paying its mana cost if you search your library this way, shuffle. So yeah, basically just lets you cast whatever you get from your next pack for free when this Which is the stupid in a roto draft because you... You can you pick just, There's no random thing. You just get your next card. So this was how I eventually got the group to agree that Alex should be forced to repick those two picks. I think you should like, have just been like, okay, cool. I'm taking Aether Searcher. <laughs> uh, well, I, would, I didn't have Tinker, so it would have, wouldn't have been that good for me. Mm, sure. It'd be really good with Tinker, though, because you just Tinker for any spell in Magic's history now. Pretty chill. Yeah. And you cast it for free, so you just get Emrakul, I guess, and then you just take an extra turn and, you know, Annihilate or six them. And you got an extra six for out of the deal. Anyway, that is just to say that... The idea that there would be a canonical list of the most powerful cards for Vintage Cube is preposterous. And if you do a full Vintage Roto, you will soon realize that there are tons of cards picked that most people would never consider for their powered Vintage Cube, and yet drafters have decided are among the best cards for their deck, even in just an eight-player draft of all of the Vintage card pool, which I think really highlights how much context matters and how much people that think they're just crafting the most powerful draft environment ever are totally, absolutely not. I'm just, I'm just really stuck on Aether Searcher now and thinking about how I'm going to fit this into a cube. It's kind of cool. It is cool. I think the thing that I'm... It's different from Arcane Savant in that you do need to still put the card in... The, the card that you're searching for in your deck. That's true. It's also a lot different because... It's really Savant. Yeah, you, Savant, you get a chance to, like, you know, see the card the rest of your draft and find something. This just lets you cast the next thing you pick, which... You can get some big dumb thing, but then, like you said, it's got to be in your deck, and half the time you're going to draw that and not the Aether Searcher. Right. It's also, like, it's worded in a really weird way, so that if you do end up drafting multiples of these, which yes. I can't imagine would happen that often in a conspiracy draft, but, you know, they want to cover their bases, then you can get any one of those cards from any of the Aether Searchers. Even if you only put one of them in your deck, so you could kind of build this little toolbox, maybe I'm going to put six Aether Searchers in a cube. <laughs> I mean, I think Aether Searcher, how would Aether Searcher be in the regular cube? Pretty bad. It's difficult to cast seven drops there. Yeah. Yeah, pretty bad. I think better than Earl of Squirrel. Sure, I could see that. But that's not a high bar. I guess this might be somebody's first episode. We are not going to go over the top 200 most powerful cards for Vintage Cube. We don't do that here. It's not important to us. I think it's boring. If that's your thing, great. Go with God and argue about whether or not the latest initiative creature is better or worse than whatever your favorite Broken Planeswalker is. Boring! In that case, what do we do here? Talk about our feelings. Okay. Uh, <laughs> here's, here's what I wanted to do. We have, I think, different ideas for this episode. We're just going to do both. Okay. My idea was I wanted to... I got. I stole this from somebody on the Discord, or at least it was adapted from somebody's recommendation on the Discord. Forgive me for not remembering your username. But basically, I have gone back and reverse engineered what the Bun Magic Cube looked like when we recorded the first episode of Lucky Paper Radio four years ago. And I want to talk about what that cube list looks like and how much my preferences, at least as they pertain to that cube, have changed over the run of this show because it's pretty different. You know, I know we've been doing this show for four years and four years is a long time, but it doesn't feel like we've been doing this show for a super long time. And then you look at the cube list from four years ago, you're like, oh, I have changed a lot in terms of what I like and dislike about this type of magic that I'm trying to curate. And I proposed this idea to you, and you were like, I don't really care or want to talk about how the regular <laughs> cube has changed over the past four years. I think you actually kind of said you don't think it's changed much. So I actually also did this and just grabbed the old list. And I was a little bit surprised by some of the things like, oh, yeah, I put that card in there for a little while, and it was definitely a huge power outlier, and it was probably a mistake. So I mean, there's Kess? definitely some things. No, Kess was there for a good reason, because it's a very, very cool card. It is a cool card. Um, but, I mean, there's plenty that we could talk about there. 
but maybe it would be more interesting for me just to sort of talk in general about sort of like how my relationship to magic has changed over the last couple of years, because it, it that seems like it's changed much more substantially than just like this one cube. I think it's worth having that conversation. I also wonder, and I think you can be repetitive if you want, how much that's going to be a repeat of some of the things we talked about with like the state of the game episodes and stuff. Yeah. But let's just do it. It'll be fine. So, this took me a long time, and I had to get your help a little bit to do a better job filtering an array by another array mm-hmm. in JavaScript to Going figure into out. Going the JavaScript minds. It's really, you know, no shade to, to Gwen and all the hard work on Cube Cobra or all the work that was done on Cube Tutor, but it's really super a shame that, like, this data is structured in a structured way, and yet I can't just say, show me this cube on this date, right? That would be... A thing that computers could do that instead I had to like try and go manually do basically because it's not really an option. It's funny how you said no shade and then you you shaded. No, I'm just saying that it's a shame <laughs> that that's not a thing that you can do. I mean, it's no expectation that Gwen is going to do it on this free platform he provides for us, right? Like, it's not that he is expected or required to do that. It's just like, well, that would be really convenient. I guess really what it is is uh, it is a shame that the incentive structures are such that a thing like Cube Cobra can't exist unless somebody just donates a bunch of their time. And as a result of that, you kind of get what you get because they're donating much of their time. It's not like it is a thing that has any other reason to exist or motivation behind it. Oh, and I guess the, while we're talking about the issues with Cube Cobra, the last thing is there's one card I can't figure out which one it is because some of the cards in the change log from the history of Cube Cobra are just marked as invalid card. And you can't figure out what card it is at all because the... IDs for Scryfall have changed over time, and Gwen has told me that they do run an occasional script to make sure that up-to-date lists are corrected for changing IDs, but they don't do that for the past change logs. So there's just a card that it's early on in the run of this podcast, I cut some card for Knight of the Ebon Legion. It was a black three or four drop alphabetically. It has to be it has to be a four drop, because it was either a three drop alphabetically after W or a four drop alphabetically before R. After Woe's Trader, before Rankle. Can't figure out what that mm-hmm. card was. I spent up with this little... Maybe I'll figure out before this episode goes live. Because I also don't have a clean list of, like, my Cube Tutor list, what it looked like when Cube Tutor got shut down, is in this enormous mess of a pile that I, like, exported when scraped from the website to get the entire change log when it was... Look, it's a huge mess. Yeah, I mean, just like you said, we don't do the boring stuff like talk about what are the top cards in the Vintage Cube. We talk about the really interesting stuff. Like, what's this one card that you cut four years ago that you can't remember? I don't know what it is. So the point is, I have 359 of the 360 cards that that consisted of the Button Magic Cube when we started this show. 202 of those 360 cards have changed in the past four years. I would have guessed a much smaller number if you had just asked me. And maybe I should have asked me and guessed before I looked at the results and looked at the results on air. But I didn't. I looked at the results first and 202 of the cards are new. Only 158 were in my cube four years ago and are still in my cube now. And even more than that, it's interesting to see what sections have like turned over completely versus sections that haven't changed barely at all. So for example, black creatures, every single one of them has changed except for Dark Confidant and Kite Sail Freebooter. Those are the only two black creatures that have been in my cube constantly for the run of this podcast which is kind of surprising to me. Yeah, that's that's a really dramatic change. And it's like, it's not even a uniform kind of change. It feels like a lot of these have been changed for different reasons. Either they printed something that was similar, but sort of more to your design goals, or you just don't have any black six drops anymore. So there's just like no more Grave Titan. Yeah. And then by comparison, like Blue Instance, there are 14 that have been in my cube for the entire run of the podcast. I cut five and added 12 more. So it's like, Really, the five cards that just didn't quite make the cut are Impulse, Negate, Thassa's Intervention, Supreme Will, Factor Fiction. Otherwise, I've kept the exact same blue instance and just added more of them. Just added more of them over time as I've gotten denser on counter spells and denser on cantrips. But a huge amount of staying power to the blue instance that have been in my cube. Really not a lot has shifted there. Also, kind of surprising, but maybe maybe it shouldn't be that surprising. I mean, maybe maybe part of it is just that there was a pretty clear identity to blue in earlier Magic, and, you know, even Magic when we started playing Cube, whereas in recent years, they've just really, really been exploring the, the design space for creatures a lot, so there's been just, like, tons of new options there. Yeah, there definitely is a pattern, it seems, of creatures changing over more than spells. I mean, even looking at black, I've had eight sorceries in my black section for the entire time. I've cut three and added five more, so closer to, like, the pattern with blue than with creatures, certainly. I think some of the biggest changes here are, one, I 
slowly over time have just been cutting planeswalkers and maybe didn't quite realize how dramatic the impact has been from where the cube started. And that also strikes me as one of the topics we haven't actually talked about that much. Like, there are other things here, like I've dramatically increased my fixing density, a topic we've discussed ad nauseum on this podcast. I've also kind of dramatically cut my curve down, another topic we've discussed a bunch. So I'm not sure how much it's worth rehashing those topics. But I used to have six planeswalkers in green. Now I have zero. I used to have six planeswalkers in white. Now I have one. I didn't realize it was so dramatic, I guess, until looking at it in this specific context. And, and, and I think a goal that has been constant through the four years since we started this show for me, for the Bun Magic Cube, has been focusing on like gameplay decisions, wanting the games to be close, to be interactive, wanting decisions about where and when to use removal and how to sequence your spells to matter. Like I've cared about all of that for the entire time. And I don't think the density of Planeswalkers really affects that goal at all, right? Like you can definitely have cubes where there is a lot of back and forth. There are a lot of tight games. There are a lot of like very important key decisions with tons of Planeswalkers and with no Planeswalkers. I think really what has changed for me is my tolerance for like bigger board complexity and that's where planeswalkers i think are some of the biggest offenders in that your tolerance has gone down my tolerance has gone down yeah i think the density of planeswalkers i was on when we started this podcast was more likely to lead to games where you had big boards on both sides of the battlefield because most of the planeswalkers that i run would produce tokens or other game objects and they themselves of course are game objects that have state that need to be tracked and that you have to keep track of if you're a player and so i think a more clarified goal for me over the past four years is how much i don't want games to be like drawn out i want games to be like decisively ended and there were specific planeswalkers i cut because i was like this planeswalker is just drawing out games and like the five mana teferi uh hero of dominaria is a great example where it's like yes that one can technically be a win condition if you get to the point that you're just tucking it into your own library and then replaying it every single turn and you eventually mill your opponent out that's happened to me before in a cube draft I do think it's kind of rare in cube draft, but it's possible. But for the most part, that card is just designed to draw the game out. It doesn't even really solidly answer any of your opponent's threats. It just like is kind of a temporary way to just get you to the late game, basically, where your deck theoretically can like take things over. And when I cut that card, I was like, I don't want a five mana card that is designed to get you to the late game. By the time you're playing your five mana cards, I want them to be the things that take over in the late game, not the things that just continue to prolong the game to get you to that point. And that one's a very obvious example, but I think a lot of these other Planeswalkers are very similar, right? Like Nissa Voice of Zendikar makes zero ones. Eventually she can make them one twos. And like, yes, if left unchecked, we'll eventually win the game. But so, so, so slowly. And so in reality, what it's really good at is like making a bunch of chump blockers that you can just buy time with and clog the board up with. And I think a lot of Planeswalkers kind of fit that mold. And even when you look at the ones that are better at decisively ending the game, your Nissa Who Shakes the World, for example, compare that to a card like Titania, you're looking at, you know, making a 3-3 three, three every turn versus making two or three five threes in one turn. Titania just ends the game so much faster and so much more decisively once you get there. It simply would not be the 200th episode without an interjection from the editing booth. I just want to add here that the other aspect of Planeswalkers and their tendency to prolong games that I didn't mention is that they often discourage attacking because you have so much value in protecting your Planeswalker and keeping it on the board as it continues to tick up and generate game pieces or virtual or literal card advantage. So even the ones that do make more threatening bodies, oftentimes you're leaving them back to protect your Planeswalker so that you can continue to accrue value over time because just cashing it in for a couple bodies is not the best thing Planeswalkers are capable of. And look, your mileage may vary. Maybe you've had Planeswalkers play totally differently in your cube, but that was my experience with the Bun Magic Cube. Which makes sense, right? Planeswalkers are by design much lower risk than the average creature, right? You can obviously strap a bunch of ETBs and cast triggers or whatever you want to creatures to make them lower risk, but on its base rate, you know, Shiv and Dragon is a lot more risky than a six-mana Planeswalker because whatever this six-mana Planeswalker does, it's going to do stuff and still leave the promise of more future stuff behind. Sure. I mean, I think it depends a lot on the Planeswalker, but I definitely agree there's an inherent modality to Planeswalkers as a card type, which means they will just they will often have some function, even if you're not able to like fully utilize it on every board state. I guess really the best way to describe it is like, uh, I have been 
steering hard away from mold drifters in the sense that they are cards that are for their impact on the like tempo of the game, the clock, how quickly the game is proceeding to a conclusion, they are overcosted, right? In Muldrich's case, a 2 2 flyer for 5 is not a good rate. That is not putting a lot of pressure on your opponent. But for their low risk, for their guaranteed return, they are, you know, adequately costed. And comparing that to, you know, traditional Bane Slayers or whatever, where you're getting a very good clock for the rate that is going to actually decisively change the race of like whose life total is decreasing and how many turns do they have before they need to find an answer. I think Planeswalkers almost entirely fit into the mole drifter side of that spectrum where they are presenting a slow clock that also has a bunch of other accrued value. And I have been drawn more and more and more over the past four years to cards that just present a fast clock and demand an answer more or less immediately, especially higher up the curve so that the game can continue to proceed to an ending sooner rather than later. And this is a goal I think I've been pretty successful in. I mean, we've played the Bun Magic Cube many times at our, like, cube nights, and the way our cube drafts work at our local game store on Tuesdays is we start at 6.30, the store closes at 10, and so we try and wrap things up by, like, 9.30, 9.45. And I would say most weeks, most cubes, you have to send a couple matches to time over the course of the entire evening just to get it done. And... Almost without fail, if we draft the Bun Magic Cube, everybody's done by 9.15, right? Because the games just are over, because there's not a lot of complexity, there's not a lot of things like Planeswalkers where you're taking a bunch of game actions a turn just to kind of prolong the game. And I don't want this to sound like I'm making it sound like the Planeswalker decisions are not meaningful or strategically important, because they are, right? I think they are very interesting to play with in the sense that you do have to, like... It's almost like each Planeswalker is kind of a mini game in and of itself. So often we get two modes where one mode is like increase my loyalty for a very marginal benefit so marginal that like if your opponent untaps and just casts a removal spell on your planeswalker you feel kind of bad because the benefit you got by upticking once is like so minimal versus down ticking for like pretty substantial benefit but now putting your planeswalker at greater risk and like that question of how you navigate those sort of two modes on many planeswalkers is like a little tempo question in and of itself which i think is very interesting but it does make games longer. And so I think that's actually one big way that my cube design sensibilities and my de- sensibilities as a player have changed over the past four years. Wait, but I'm still stuck on, you said Planeswalkers are mole drifters, but don't they accrue value over time? Aren't they like the, the definition of Bane Slayer outside of, you know, Bane Slayer? I mean... It's, fi- it's time we finally get into this issue. <laughs> I mean, we could talk about it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think there's somewhere in between on average... Because, yes, the more turns you have for the Planeswalker, the more value it's going to accrue. The same way, the more times you get to attack or block with your Baneslayer Angel, the more value you got out of your five mana. But it's also, like, almost universally with a Planeswalker, it's impossible to answer it entirely with one spell. Like, you just sure, you, you can't yeah. just get rid of the value that your opponent has just spent their five mana on cleanly. There's always something left behind. Uh, and so that something left behind also tends to, like, scale up over time, right? Where, like... If you if they had their Planeswalker for three turns, then you find the removal spell. That's way different than them having attacked for a couple turns with Bane Slayer Angel, then you found the removal spell. You know? Sure, yeah. Maybe your life total swung a little bit, but that's compared to them More having... More than a little bit. I mean, Let's maybe give you, Bane Slayer some credit. I mean, maybe you chump block it a couple times, they gained 10 yeah. life, and you lost you know two little flying tokens from your Lingering Souls or something. Like That's not good for Crisis. you. That's not good for you, but that's a lot better than them having ticked up three or four times with their Nissa Who Shakes the World or whatever, and just like generated an insane amount of value before you could find that removal spell so interact with that with the tempo axis and i'm talking about tempo purely in like the how close is the game to ending tempo which i mean 200th episode we should talk about what tempo means again too we should cover bane slayers and mall drifters i didn't include either bane slayer or mall drifter in the intro this week oh no maybe that's go, a huge maybe i'll go edit some of the <laughs> some of the lyrics i don't know anyway we got to cover all the things in our 200th episode. I, I think that they interact differently with that tempo axis. Then they're not, they don't fit cleanly into that like bucket, obviously, but when it comes to how they interact with the length of the game, I do think most planeswalkers tend to draw the game out and create bigger boards, which means more complexity, which means longer turns. Even if the game isn't necessarily longer in terms of number of turns, if you're dealing with a more complicated board state, then that can make the same number of turns take longer than it would if you had a more simple board state. And something I feel like has come up a couple times in the Discord that has been irksome to me is the conflation of complexity with strategy, where 
people are like, well, of course I want lots of decisions to make. That's just a better, that's just more strategy you can have. And we've said it before in this show, but it's become so important to me, this distinction between different types of complexity. And I really love strategic complexity where you can understand your options very quickly and the choice you make has a substantial impact on the direction and outcome of the game. Like those decisions are great. I really dislike the decisions where it's like the hard part is actually figuring out what your options even are. Like there's so many, so much complexity available here that trying to figure out, I don't know, I guess it comes down to like, for me, making a decision between like three options and the outcome really matters is so much more interesting to me than making a decision between 40 options and the outcome kind of matters. And in the aggregate, when you're making 12 decisions a turn of 40 options you have available to you, it's really going to matter, right? And I think a lot of people are under the impression that that means that that's more opportunity for skill expression, but I'm not convinced it is. I think a lot of that is just the ability to manage a lot of complexity in your head and not necessarily strategic complexity, which is admittedly kind of a blurry line. Yeah, I mean, I think that's sort of like the, the thing that a game is, one way we could describe a game is sort of just this decision tree that players are moving through. And so, yes, having more complexity means that that decision tree is bigger, so there's the the potential for more meaningful decision making, but I think in reality it's just really really hard to design a game where all of these like really complex situations are maximized and meaningful because there might just be like this whole area of that decision tree which just kind of gets optimized away or it's just like too hard to see at the end. It's like, do you want to make a 2-2 or draw a card or deal two damage to your opponent? It's like, well, if you give me 40 of these options that are kind of really similar and they're all kind of moving me towards victory the same amount, there's a lot of complexity there that's just not that important. Is that kind of what you mean? Yeah, like, I don't know, a dumb hypothetical I could describe is that like, if the way magic worked is every time you cast a creature, you got to choose two of all of the ability tokens that have ever existed in the game right it's like you can choose any two you can choose from any of these options whatever ones you want right and maybe what that means is most of the time you know flying and first strike or whatever are we're going to leave stuff like you know indestructible and double strike and these broken ones aside just imagine the like evergreen keywords maybe it turns out that like flying is just one of the best ones you're almost always choosing that and sometimes you're choosing other options that would be a much more decision-rich game. Every single time I play a creature, I have to choose from these 30 abilities, and do I want this one to have Death Touch or Trample or Flying or whatever? But in reality, you're actually kind of only choosing the best one most of the time, and that's why we have heuristics as players. That's why we have these rules of thumb, because it's impossible to play this game and actually start at a blank slate with every decision. You You wouldn't be able to do it within the available time to play any game. So that's where all these heuristics come from. And the more that you have just a bunch of complicated decisions that are undermining the heuristics that your players have set for themselves, the more I don't think you're actually increasing strategic complexity. You're just increasing complexity complexity. And yeah, like the Sam Blacks of the world who are just really good at managing that complexity, that makes them a better Magic player strategically because they're able to get to the strategic decisions faster than I think a lot of their opponents are able to. But I think you can also design an environment where the average player can arrive at the strategic decisions faster, but that doesn't mean it's any less deep or nuanced or skillful for the players that are good at managing that complexity. Yeah, I I think that that makes sense to me, more or less. I I, I guess what I'll say is I don't think that with all these changes over the past four years, to make the Bun Magic Cube mechanically simpler, make the board states smaller, make the game shorter, I don't think any of those changes have made it easier to play, have made it so better players just lose more often to variants because they don't have as many small decisions to express their skill. Like, I don't think any of the, like, things you could describe as downsides of what people perceive that complexity to mean have been evident in my list. If anything, honestly, I think the better players just win even more. But that's also because probably over the past four years, I've also just continued to narrow the power level band. I mean, Oko is in my cube as of four years ago. As of four years ago, okay. Yeah, so I mean, it is currently not in there. It's definitely currently not in there. But yeah, things like Oko are in there, and man, I had Nether Void in my cube at this point. That's you had Plow Under. That's a throwback. Plow Under is just bad. So I mean, the power level band has definitely gotten narrower, which is maybe another reason that skillful players are still able to find relative success in this environment compared to less skilled players. I also just don't think that like making an environment really complex is the best, or even a reliable way to make sure that 
people are able to express their skill. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with that. Like, that fundamental thesis makes perfect sense to me. The other thing that I would describe from looking at this list four years ago is I honestly thought I had come further than I obviously had when we started this podcast from just not playing cards that, you know, are the quote-unquote, like, vintage cube staples. Again, my Bun Magic Cube started because I watched a bunch of people play the Magic Online Vintage Cube on YouTube and thought Cube was really cool, and it was, like, the first Cube in our play group. And so I was like, well, we have to play all the cards people expect to play in Cube or whatever. And now we're really lucky to live in this world where we have so many Cubes in the play group that I think people are really freed to explore their own independent creative idea because they know that, oh, we have four or five legacy cubes and a few powered vintage cubes and a bunch of it. Like if people want that experience, there are other outlets for it. And I, you know, this cube still has Armageddon in it. It has opposition in it. It has upheaval and wildfire and cards that I, I would just plow under. You mentioned cards that I think are emblematic of a certain era of the vintage cube that even if you would ask me at the time, I would be hard pressed probably to like explain why that is in line with my goals. I probably would have said something like, oh, I think white aggro needs Armageddon. Like, it's important for it to have it because otherwise it can't win. I would have said that back then. I don't think it holds up. (laughs) Sitting here today, I don't think it holds up, but I think that's probably what I thought at the time. But what I was really doing is kind of jumping through hoops mentally to justify what actually was just a card. It felt like I should put it in there because all of the cube I had watched on YouTube, that was like a staple of this deck, was Armageddon in the white aggro decks. And... I feel much more free now to just be like, no, I'm pursuing the kind of gameplay that I want. And again, honestly, I thought by the time we started this podcast, I had come further down that road, but obviously I hadn't. Sure. So you mean like this looks closer to your initial cube design than you expected? Yes, I guess so. And I guess in fairness, I started my cube initially like seven years ago. So this is, you know, also time-wise closer to... Man, that's crazy to think about. That's yeah. That's where this podcast is not feel like we've been doing it for that long like if you ask me okay how long have you been designing cubes and what percentage of that time have you been recording this podcast i would have thought i've been recording the podcast for a third of the time i've been designing cubes at most but it's actually like 65 to 75 percent of the time i've been designing cubes which is weird to think about so yeah it's a lot closer to like what was the first version of my cube than i thought strip mine strip mine I think strip mine belongs in so few cubes. It's I think it's really hard to have a cube where strip mine is any fun and makes any sense. I think it's it's fun half the time. Yeah. I see what you're saying. I get your joke about it's fun to be the one strip mining something, but is it even? So anyway, I guess in a roundabout way, this is a lens into the ways in which I have changed as a player, which is to say that as a player and cube designer, I've just come a lot further than I thought in four years. I thought four years ago I was more of the designer I am today, but I was much closer to still feeling a bunch of inherited baggage of what Vintage Cube ought to be back when we started this podcast. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad that you grew past that. (laughs) Glad you got good, scrub. (laughs) Exactly. Thank you for saying that more clearly. Riftwing Cloudskate. Glenelandra Archmage. These cards do not work in my modern version of this cube at all. So how have you grown and changed, Anthony? You've been very quiet this entire time. Great question. You I'll, know... I'll have cut out all the empty space that I paused to give you... Dragon Lord of Tarka. All the empty space that I will have paused to give you a chance to maybe say something that you had nothing to say, which is fine. But what do you want to say about your own growth as a player? You know, so magic has changed a lot in the last four years. And yeah. I, I think that when we started this podcast... I was really sort of at my peak investment in the game. I was at a point where I was really invested in limited. I was trying to get in as many drafts as I could, which, you know, it's kind of wild. Can I offer a slight clarification? Yeah. I think you and maybe I were at our peak investment in Magic four to five months before we started this podcast. Yes. Because then the coronavirus happened. Yes. Uh, Well, but I don't even know if that's, that's accurate, though, because, I mean, yeah, so a little bit before we started the podcast... I was drafting as much as possible, and what that meant was, like, max two times a week, uh, because I'd go draft at FNM, and then maybe we'd get in one other draft. Well, we used to draft on Wednesdays before we decubed all and the time. on Wednesdays. We would draft most Wednesdays at the local game store. Right. And, and in our office before that. Then we started, like, really getting into cube designs around this time. I mean, this, this is why I think, like, maybe I was even more invested as the pandemic began because I didn't have much else going on. So it was like, Hey, let's, uh, it's Tuesday night. Let's design another cube. And 
I think I designed like six or seven. My, my second cube, actually, uh, literally the the last cards for it came in the mail the week of lockdown. And it yeah, was this like, is the mono black here's cube. the mono black cube. We're ready to draft it. Oh, wait, I guess we'll have to wait two weeks until this blows over. We did eventually draft it. 18 it was months later, 18 we months did later. draft it. Um, but I, I mean, to be honest, my involvement, my investment in magic has just come down a lot. And that's been kind of difficult for me because it is obviously a hobby that I've invested a lot in. We do this podcast. We've made a lot of sort of social connections and it is really important to me, but it's also less important to me than it was at that point. And that's kind of a difficult space to be in where it's like, okay, if I graph sort of the bell curve of my enthusiasm about magic, maybe I'm where I was six years ago. So I'm still pretty enthusiastic about it, but the trajectory is kind of going down. Okay, so on this bell curve, the X is not time. It's how invested... No, the X how is does the time. Bell curve the work? X is time. So you're assuming that your investment in the game is going to be a bell curve? Yeah. Well, so far, it's, yeah, maybe just kind of is going that the, up. Is that the classic kind of application down. of a bell curve? <laughs> Look, you can have curves for whatever reason you want. <laughs> And it's it's a little bit, there's a, a weird dissonance to me that I've been struggling with about, like, how much do I... It's hard being in that space where it's like, I care about this less than I used to, but can I still feel like I did six years ago when I was this invested, but it was increasing? Does that make any sense? It does make sense. And I, th- I think what you're basically saying is, like, if you took... If you were able to actually measure the amount of time your brain is thinking about magic, you're right. at a similar place as six years ago, but what you don't have is this, like feeling of promise that you could continue to get more invested in it and be rewarded more deeply because you've already been down that road and you found the limits of how much the game could give back to you and so now you're more like i don't know i don't see it as a bell curve i feel like it's uh what are the kinds of curves called where you've got imagine a value a y value a line a y value horizontal line and then you have a line approaching it and you're basically like you've got some function or algorithm that is trying to get the line to match that value but it like vacillates around it a little bit you know what i mean uh chaos i i think there is a a, an amount that the game will make sense to you in your life and i think that amount is probably not zero the way the bell curve would imply where it's like well we started at zero and we'll i mean obviously eventually we'll end at zero for sure that's where it all ends but i don't think that will be a bell curve shape Uh, i think there will be like uh you know there was a period where, yeah, it was like really exciting because the game felt new and vast and it felt like the more we learned and got invested in it, we just found more people and more interesting things going on such that it was like this constant discovery and like novelty. And yeah, that that's gone. I mean, there's yeah. none of that anymore. It's like, I feel like a perfect example is like going to our first GP where it's like, oh, this is like a thing where once you get invested enough in the game, you go to a GP and like that's a thing you get to experience. And You know, if we were more interested in playing competitively, there'd be like the whole trail of like competitive events all the way up to the Pro Tour or something, which is never on the map for either of us. But I feel like that same kind of like ecosystem exists casually too, where it's like you get more and more invested and you kind of unlock more types of ways you can play and more parts of your life that become about the game. And yeah, at some point, I think you and I kind of saw the end and you're like, well, that's, I can see it now and that's not exactly what I want. And so I guess there's no more like promise and not having that like goal in the distance definitely just changes the vibe and i think that actually for a lot of players it their experience with magic is not a curve up and then a slow curve down the experience is more of a curve up and then a cliff it just drops off and you know i've heard so many stories of people that you know like they were really invested and then they just sold off all their cards and got out and that's kind of maybe where i'm struggling with this point of like Am I going to fall off a cliff or can I just appreciate this kind of like lower level of engagement, but still be engaged? And I have like a long list here of like gripes with the game because they really, really magic has fundamentally changed the way that the game operates in so many ways. But I think, like you said, we've we've kind of covered a lot of that. And that's not really necessarily what's important. I I I will say, though, I did go back and listen to a couple really early episodes of the show Mm because I was curious to try to get a flavor of like, all right, where were we at the point when we were recording this show? Scary. Well, no, I mean, obviously the show is a lot worse. Don't do this. Don't don't do what I did, listeners. <laughs> like, if you're newer to the show, listen backwards and then stop whenever it gets not good anymore. But I was struck by, specifically in early episodes, we specifically said, like, four years ago is when we were getting some of the first, like, whiffs of, like, more treatments of cards and, like, more sets per year. And we said a couple times, like, this is just good. 
more options for like yeah. cards for players like it doesn't hurt anybody to have more cards and it just means that there are more cards for different groups of players and when it comes to special printings and versions it's like you can ignore it if you want to but it's also just there as like another way for people to get more into the game and express themselves and on paper that still is true but i think we have felt over the past four years how much that is actually not true and there actually are substantial and maybe hard to measure costs to just continuing to ramp everything up with no end in sight yeah yeah i mean and i I connect that to sort of my own experience of is infinite growth or you know as much growth as possible actually something that's worth pursuing versus just sort of uh feeling comfortable in a steady state and I think that's where I'm at personally, where I'm kind of realizing that actually, yeah, that like continued growth and growing enthusiasm is not necessarily even positive or healthy for me. And maybe just, you know, we're playing once a week and I'm spending another night or two here or there uh, playing a couple of games of Commander or whatever. That kind of steady state is actually a better place for me. And I feel sort of like a little bit of an imposter. I mean, the way that other people engage with the game is so much more significant uh, to the point where they're, you know playing online daily and designing a lot more cubes and doing all kinds of other stuff. And that's just not where I'm at. So I think it's maybe just important for me to be honest with myself and also people that maybe respect my opinion about the game that there's kind of limits to how much I want to engage with it. I mean, I think I was thinking about this a lot last week when Parker got hard, hard trolled by r slash free magic, which a couple weeks ago at this point. A couple weeks yeah. ago. Like, that was rough. And something that I it sort of occurred to me I mean, me you is, shouldn't have read any of it, is what I'll say. Definitely true. Just don't. It's not worth it. Something that occurred to me is that a lot of these people are maybe stuck in this space where they are just playing this game that is all about a zero-sum experience, and that's all they're steeped in. And so when someone says, well, I maybe have a little bit of a critical thought about this, they're not used to a kind of experience that is more about a dialogue. And you're going to contribute something and I'm going to contribute my own dialogue. And it's like the only mode that they are prepared to receive new information is in this adversarial zero-sum sense. And other people kind of push back on that and were joking like, oh yeah, like magic is about violence, but so let's just change it. Let's all play Arch Enemy or all play, you know, fight the Horde games. And, and and I that wasn't really my point either. My point was more just that, you know, fiction and games are really important because they provide a safe place where you can engage with difficult topics. And, you know, the fact that we can play this game and get into the space where we're talking about adversity and a zero-sum experience is useful because then we can step away from it and have a different experience and understand these topics better having a diverse range of experience. I, this feels very roundabout, but on the other hand, I think it's sort of important to then just reflect on, okay, it's it's okay for me to play Magic and have this one experience that is somewhat narrow in scope, because I'm then going to go do other hobbies as well, and the collection of these different perspectives is going to make me a more complete, interesting person. I have a lot of thoughts. All right. Start with the first one. So, in order, roughly, I do think it is more than most people realize fundamentally difficult to maintain anything in a steady state under free market capitalism like we live in a system yeah, that's so I, that's so fundamentally to its bones values constant growth and if you're not growing you ought to be eliminated for something that is growing and we should not have steady stable things we should have an ongoing churn of things that are growing to be the next giant thing that then eventually get gobbled up by the next giant thing and that's what things are. And I, I look at people in my life and I see how they interact with their hobbies and things that are meaningful to them that ostensibly should be removed from that value system that aren't actually governed by those principles. But I think so deep in like everyone's bones is this idea that like, yes, you have to be like yearning and striving for something that it's really hard to just have a creative practice where you just make something for yourself or just have a hobby that you do for yourself at a steady pace and you don't worry about how it's perceived by others or whether you are getting better at something or whether you are like improving or whatever because this like value of growth is so deeply ingrained in everything. Yeah, I mean it's it's so deeply ingrained and so fundamental that it's really really difficult to see that it's there because yes. it's just it is just the norm. It's asking the fish to describe the water. Exactly. It's like, well, it's uh, um what do you mean? What's it's water? The, it's the stuff, you know? It's like <laughs> so 
I'm very sympathetic to your feelings about the game in that regard, where it's like, yeah, it's really hard to just be like, this is just a thing I do, and it doesn't matter if I'm getting better, getting more skilled, designing new cubes, like improving or whatever. I feel that way about the podcast, right? I, I, I really try hard to not care about whether or not we're getting more downloads every week than we were getting the week before, or whether or not, like, the audience is growing or whatever. I mean, in a certain way, like, obviously, this is not monetized, so, like, and I, it's one of the reasons why it is explicitly not monetized is because it's really important to me to try hard to not care about it, and it's already an uphill battle for me to not care about it when it doesn't mean anything for anybody except for, like, you know, line go up, you know, and brain endorphin. But it's really hard to not measure and be like, well, we've been doing this for four years. We should continue to like do better at it. Right. And if we do better at it, we should get more listeners. And like, that is just so that like churn is just baked into everything. So I'm very sympathetic to that. I personally, if I were you would not spend any time trying to dissect the psyche of the R slash free magic freaks. I think a lot of it. Bo- I think that's good advice. <laughs> I think a lot of it. I mean, it's not that it's not I mean, that it's right. not that like that shouldn't be unpacked culturally. Someone should figure it out. It shouldn't be you, you know, just in your spare time. I, I think a lot of it comes down to people that are just angry, and this is an outlet where they can go dunk on something and feel smart and like be surrounded by other people that are similarly angry. And I don't think it is productive or. I think in some ways you're giving them too much credit. I think it's just fun to be angry on the internet. Like it's just that's just been proven that like it's fun to be a like, troll and like on people. And if you can find a community of like-minded that are willing to like dunk on the same people you want to dunk on, then it gives you a sense of community and you can just go be a people and that's just fun for people to do. Fair. I mean, maybe I was using that more of a jumping off point. I didn't read a ton of what was happening there, but just sort of like thinking about I mean, I think it's even on our about page that we like to use magic as a tool for thinking about epistemology. And I'm over here just reading my Benjamin Whorf thinking about linguistic relativity and how that probably does apply to other experiences more than language. I mean, <laughs> don't make me do this. <laughs> we got to do all the things in episode 200. I mean, it, it, it does like the thing that fascinates me most about that stupid blowback is like, OK, a person has an opinion you disagree with. Why is that not an acceptable state of things? Right, which is exactly my point. Of right, maybe like just the 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 game space. This person allow that. seeing something different in the game that you like. Okay, I don't see that in the game. Is there any reason for you to like go ape and like lose your mind? No, it's like it's because it, 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 that's why I think it comes down to this fundamental like territorialism of like people that have a hard life, like. Some of the people that have been the most difficult for us to deal with in our local play group have been people that we know just are having a rough go of it, right? Like other things in their life are not going so hot. Their job is really bad right now. Maybe they're unemployed. They like how are having hard times with their families or something. It's like, and so magic becomes the one thing in their life where it's like, this is a good thing. And that gets all of the pressure of yeah. being the one good thing put on it. And then when somebody says, hey, here's a magic set that I think was amiss in this way that's kind of important to me and I think we should be critical of. It doesn't say to you, oh, here's a person who has a different idea than me. Maybe I can share my thoughts with them or maybe I just let it live and let live. It says to them, this person is trying to take this thing that is meaningful and important to me because it's one of the only places that I feel in control. And I, I really think when you get to the, the bottom of a lot of the free magic people, it's people that are dealing with stuff and they have put a bunch of expectation and meaning on the game that is completely misplaced and as a result they are emotionally much more invested in it than they have any right to be which is funny because the thing they will tell everyone else is that they're being emotional and irrational but actually it's them you know it's always the pot calling the kettle black but but right. yeah I, I think it makes it really hard like when magic when you it's a, it's a game it's a game friends and when you are that invested in the game that you come unraveled when somebody says something you disagree with about it or, you know, in the case of our local playgroup, come on Ravel when you lose a commander game or someone does something that you don't agree with in a, you know, in a game decision space. Like, someone, why did you someone remove... Someone drafts Arcane Savant in a full vintage Roto. Why, why did you remove that enchantment? You should have removed this enchantment. Like, people will go crazy. Uh, and almost always it's because I think people just, they, they're they going through some stuff, you know? Yeah. I mean, but I think that that is a valuable thing for me to reflect on because 
I also should not put too much pressure on it. It's like, yeah, I don't want to draft as much this week. Fine. That's okay. I can I can yeah. do other stuff and not put too much pressure on it. Or, I mean, maybe more importantly, I don't want to be the wizard just destroying magic guy. Uh, so maybe I should just not be. It's like they're destroying magic. Fine. It's like, did go do enjoy that. I mean, that and that's fundamentally why we play cube. I mean... I think yeah. the degree to which you and I have become disillusioned and like less engaged with the game over the past couple years, which is, I think it's different for both of us. But I think if you and I were invested in another form of magic, we would be long gone. Yeah. Like, no, and, I, and, I, I would not be continuing to slog through all the crap in Legacy or whatever. Yes. Because Cube is the one place where we can actually meaningfully ignore some of that stuff. Yeah, and I, that's sort of the positive end point I was I wanted to get to which is that I think maybe when we started this podcast I was sort of like yeah you know cube is kind of this like quirky it's kind of kind of this punk way to play the game and especially in the last couple of months I've just been feeling like no it's really punk and this is really the important aspect to it is that yes it it really does let us get outside of this sort of like yes capitalist cycle of the way that they are you know make the number a little bit bigger on every card so you have to buy the next card because now the number is a little bit bigger being able to escape that just feels more and more important the more the game has become more i mean yeah the 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 more the game changes and becomes about certain things the more it is important to me that we can escape from that system through cube and i i appreciate that and it's been so incredible actually to to see a lot of especially the sort of like small events around cube that have been popping up because they so radically break the mold of any other event where it's like literally just some person is saying I want to make this happen. I'm going to run it at a cost or run it at a loss even and just make this happen. It's like, it's kind of an insane thing to be happening in this country where... I think more events than you think maybe are actually run kind of like that. Okay, well... Like, not the big not the big SCG cons and sure. stuff like that, but there's a lot of, like, little passion, little passion projects for Legacy or for Old School mm-hmm. or for Popper. Like, there's a lot of communities out there that have their own events where people are running them just because it's a thing sure. they want to do for the community. In Cube, the difference is to me that it's like, that's fundamental. Like, there's no other option. Like, it's yeah. it's not that, like, it's not happening elsewhere. It's that that's the only way it can ever happen in Cube is that you have somebody that's, like, just wants to do the thing, you know? Right. And, and I do think that's sort of, like, the way the game functions as, you know, a, a system that makes you think in certain ways affects in subtle ways the way that you behave. I think that is true. And the fact that Cube is this format that requires people to engage in a different level of like I'm curating the space that people are going to share in and people are going to have a a good or bad experience based on me the cube designer is kind of like acting as a host I think the fact that people are coming to it with those particular logistical needs do change the way that they talk about the game and think about the game and it just draws an audience a group of people that is much more interesting and positive and focused on community than maybe other formats are yeah for sure so I got to ask you. Okay. We can cut this out if you want. Sure. This is too much. I think you and I share a lot of our disillusionment and distancing ourselves mm-hmm. from the grind of what modern magic has become. I mean, this manifests in like very plain ways. Like you and I are both just kind of like spoiler season. <laughs> Great. Like I mostly don't care. Like I can't keep up. It's too much. If and when I want to like make a new cube in the future or like make changes to my cube, then I'll go look at these cards. But like I'm not constantly absorbing things and like excitedly gobbling up every new spoiler because I just it's just too much right yeah. I can't keep up with it I mean to frame this in like a pretty literal way I spent a lot of money on magic and for a long time like there was less. I mean, yeah. a narrative that really worked for me which was a lie but the narrative was you know I'm gonna go draft on a Friday night I'm gonna spend 15 bucks in the draft it's as much as I would spend on a movie or some other social activity but then I also get these cards and like that level of financial engagement was easy for me to cope with uh you know that narrative worked even though it wasn't true because i was also like i'm gonna buy a booster box to stash away for a flashback draft at some point and i'm gonna upgrade my commander deck and all these other things buy a bunch of sleeves so it wasn't necessarily accurate but it was a functional narrative and as they just sort of like ramped up production and have just increased how much stuff is being made like it just got to a point where it's like this narrative doesn't work anymore like I, have, I can't even lie to myself about this been, anymore. Exactly. It's like, <laughs> I have been your sucker for so long, and that worked for me until you started telling me to my face that I was a sucker. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I like there's, there's not a narrative that lets me engage in that way anymore. Yeah, I definitely, I mean, 
prior to building the 100 Ornithopters cube, which I did do a lot through trades, but I ended up having to buy like 100 cards or something worth of singles. Prior to that, I mean, cards. prior All to of the Ornithopters. <laughs> okay, okay, I did have to buy the Ornithopters too, but that's, you know, a different thing. But prior to that, you know, yeah, I have spent so much less money on the game in the past few years than in the years prior. And for me, a lot, it was almost always Cube I was spending a lot of money on. I was constantly, you know, upgrading and getting my, like, chase cards that I didn't think I'd ever be able to afford for the Cube. And then, you know, one came along on eBay and I was able to justify it or whatever. And over time, you spend a lot of money that way. And at some point, I both, like, got to the end where it's like, well, that's all the cards I could ever want to have mm-hmm. for this Cube. I'm not going to put power in it. I'm not going to put, you know, these reserve list cards. Like, I'm, I have no interest in playing these cards, even if they were cheaper. So, like, I've kind of capped out there. And then it was like, and also, I just don't feel it anymore. So, in a very real sense, you know, in, in one of the few ways you could actually measure, we are way less engaged in the game in terms of just spending money. But what I was going to say is that over all the time that I've become, I think, equally or similarly disillusioned with magic and the direction of the game and how it's handled as a business and all that kind of crap, I don't think I've lost any enthusiasm for cube which is to say that like i always have a cube project i'm brewing and for big periods of time i'm really just thinking about the bun magic cube and i'm like thinking about changes there and tweaking and like you know modifying the list and then something like the degenerate micro cube or the ornithopter cube comes along and it like captures my attention for four to six months neoclassical cube is another great example and a lot of times when i'm focusing on that the bun magic cube will take a back seat and i won't be as much focused on that but like i'm always focused on one of these projects and that's like what keeps me engaged and like playing the game I feel like you don't even update your cubes ever. <laughs> like it's been it's been a while. Like I love the Turbo Cube, and every time we talk about drafting it, I'm like, "But what about the 15 great cards we've talked about that you were like, yeah. I should get one of those. That's a great idea." And then it's just still not there. I'm like, I just want to play it. <laughs> it's like <laughs> maybe I should just give it to you. <laughs> no, I. So I'm, what I'm wondering is, here's my question, which I can cut out if you don't want to talk about this. But like, is it really just that? that Hasbro printing a hundred secret layers and a bunch of different versions of cards and coming out with 15 new sets every year and all the IP crossovers. Like has that sapped your excitement for the game so much that you also don't want to work on your thing, your thing behind the, you know, the gated fence that you can actually do whatever you want with where you can actually ignore that stuff. Is it too draining to just have to sift through the to find the things you care about or is there something else going on? I think it's it's just I don't feel like forcing myself. It's it's not that Yeah, I, I mean, am, I'm not forcing myself. Like I wish I could stop thinking about the Ornithopter yeah. cube. <laughs> I just can't. Yeah, and so I don't necessarily have that that compulsion in the same way where, you know, especially the first couple months of lockdown during the pandemic, it was just like, yeah, there's some project I'm brewing and I'm going to every 3 weeks start a new cube and and think about all the different ways to to explore this. And yeah, I mean, I think that's just to me limits to how far I want to push that and yeah, I do like abstractly want to make updates to these cubes, but also I'm appreciating the kind of steady state of our, the way our playgroup is working and the regular cube still functions. There's and definitely no pressure on it externally to be updated, right? Which right. is maybe what you're like, it's a great cube, it functions, the, the nature of cube is that it never has to be updated, so like you've got it, you can just bring it to cube net every Tuesday and it could be there as a third cube option or you know every couple months you draft it as a primary cube. Like there is no external force on it, which is different than... You know, when we had no cubes in the play group, and it was like, well, we want to have cubes, so we have to do it. Like, there's work that has to be done for us to play what we want to play. Yeah, I mean, that's another big aspect to it. It's just that there are so many cubes now, it's not necessary, and that's kind of... I I value that. Yeah, I guess my feeling about that is that I kind of... For me, I'm like, I wish there was a few less cubes so I could draft my cubes more. <laughs> and I don't get that sense from you at all. Yeah, you just gotta, just gotta care less, Andy. Stop caring so much about stuff. I mean, this is the part of the game that I love, right? This is the part that I don't feel sapped at all is the part where i get to brew my own lists and like play them with people and learn from them and then modify them that part has never gotten any less engaging to me it is the fact that that is next door to this factory and you can smell it through the fence and you can smell it through the fence like harsh words that part's not great but it just seems it seems more all-encompassing your disillusionment than maybe my own I mean, I think a big aspect, and I, I didn't mean to get into all this stuff, but like it, the fact that the game has many different facets is, I think, what makes it a thing that you can get into and get stuck in for a long time, because 
playing the game is just one tiny aspect. Like, honestly, collecting was a big thing for me for a long time, and uh, brewing decks, and designing cubes, and appreciating the art and story. Like, the fact that all these pieces fit together, and for a long time fit into an ecosystem of, like, like a logistical process of, I'm going to go do a draft. Okay, I also got a couple singles for a commander deck. Also, I enjoyed, you know, seeing this new world building. It all kind of fit together and fed off each other and supported itself. And so... Cube still was part of that that infrastructure that now is gone, basically. So it is a little bit. I mean, we say Cube will outlive Magic, but if if Magic dies, I, it's it's hard to keep up that motivation without that cluster oh, yeah, of other clear, activities. Oh yeah, to be clear, the playmat's not a statement of fact. It's a call. To, <laughs> it's a call to arms. Right, right. It's a it's a you know a, a statement of like value that we should try and value yeah. this. Yeah, I mean, I, I see that. I guess. Uh, it would be much easier for me to make cubes and paper if I was still plugged into all those other avenues. And that's what made it easy to get into cube in the first place is that I had all these cards from commander decks that I had taken apart that I needed something to do with. And I was drafting every week. So I had opportunities to open the new card from the new set that I want to get. Whereas like now I just try and find the right window where it's like, well, I want a slick shot show off. So when's it going to be the right price? And I just, and that's way less fun than going every week and being like, did anyone open a slick shot show off? Do you need it for anything? Can we trade? Can I trade you for it? Like that is way more engaging and so, yes, in that sense, the fact that my cube design is not entangled with other ways to play the game has made it much more isolated. Maybe another aspect to it is just that, you know, th- things have limits. <laughs> and, like, the, the, the process of learning uh-huh. learning about something and developing a new skill isn't something that can happen forever. I mean, it's the same thing. It's just you can't have infinite growth. And so, for me, a uh, fun... I mean, it was a fun, but it was also a frustrating experience of, like, getting into Cube was like, hey, you all are here talking about Cube in this way of just, let's put all the best cards in a box. And it was engaging to me to enter into this community and be like, that doesn't really make sense. And actually, we can think about Cube in a very different way. Ah, but you fixed it now. And now I've fixed it. And, like, (laughs) honestly, like, yeah, the community has drastically changed and talks about design in this totally different way. And it's like, cool, we did that. It's done. (laughs) I mean, so it's, yeah, I don't, I don't really know. Well, 200 episodes. That's it. <laughs> Seal it up. <laughs> well, I was going to say, I can cut this out too if you want. We've talked about off air. You don't have to be on every episode of this podcast if you don't want. I feel like you feel a pressure like you need or want to be on every episode of this podcast. I am more than happy to talk to Patrick and Aaron about the full vintage Roto. Sure. And you don't have to be here if you don't want to. And if that would give you some additional space to, like, maintain excitement if you don't have this pressure of, like, having to make a podcast every single week. Yeah, I mean, I would say, here we are, just having a candid conversation on the podcast. I, mean, uh, I, I could cut it out, I don't the, know. The set review episodes in particular, I'm just like, I don't yeah, really have Yeah, I know. Any. I got mad at you and Parker on yeah. the last one because yeah. you're such a f***ing <laughs> drag. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I mean, but here's this other thing about it is, like, I was just joking the other night when I couldn't remember Magic Card, and I'm like, this is delightful. I have this space that I've regained uh, that used to be full in my brain of a magic card that now I have more space for all these really important facts about COD. That's that a beautiful in optimistic there. take instead of just thinking that your overall capacity is just linearly don't, decreasing don't, as you no, get older. Don't do that. Don't so do you're that losing some magic nope. and you're losing some facts about COD and you're losing nope. somewhere to just put my keys. Getting all those COD facts in there. <laughs> nice and full. <laughs> mm, full of COD, just like I want to be. <laughs> Let's just go eat hot dogs. I have some hot dogs from John Brown oh, upstairs. Shit, really? Yeah, we're going to go make some hot dogs right okay. now. Okay, I love hot dogs. Yeah. I think, didn't we mention that in the first or on an early episode, we talked about how much we love hot dogs. So it all comes back could around. could have brought some homemade sauerkraut. I mean, I got to cook the hot dogs. You can go home and get it if you want. It's far away. Okay. I have, <laughs> I have some really good mustard for the hot dogs too. Oh, shit. Yeah, it's going to be good. Anyway, we're going to go eat some hot dogs. Thanks for listening to episode 200 of Lucky Paper Radio. And thanks for being along for the ride, however long you've been along for the ride for. The show is not over, but is Anthony having fun doing it? <laughs> Who knows? Maybe this will become a, a podcast about recipes. I don't know. The set reviews are a great example because, like, I still think it's interesting to talk about the new cards. Like, I don't know. I guess my, my disillusionment doesn't carry as far as, like, I want to talk about what Slickshot Show Off is like and what it does and how it's interesting and how it's new and novel. That's still exciting to me. But we'll figure out what happens when the next set comes out, which is actually Modern Horizons, which is an interesting one. I'll be curious to see... If you feel a little spark in your loins when Modern Horizons cards come out, because historically you've really liked the Modern Horizons sets for the regular cube. Yeah. I mean, yeah. The Modern Horizons set, in particular the first one, really 
had a big impact on me thinking about Cube because it was like a, a lot of really clean, nice designs that, you know, there was just space that, that they couldn't necessarily mix and match keywords in such a free way as they could in there. So like, I, I thought it was a really interesting set, but the last one just felt like such a, we printed bigger numbers. So now everybody needs to go buy the bigger number cards. And also just such a like shallow, I'm sorry. I'm just going to be really mean now. <laughs> you say like, that, but you had a ton of cards you were excited about from Modern Horizons 2. We have a yeah, four-hour yeah. set right. review to, yeah. as evidence to this. Uh, but but line go down. Um, no, no. This one, You're it's confused. Like, line this, go up. This one, you know, they have, uh, what is it? The the white of the reliquary. And it's like, come on, guys. Like I thought Pondering Mage was The cool, first one had that, too. And I remember you The first being, one had Giver of Runes. I remember you being critical of of some of that and being like, Pondering Mage is so dumb. Like this. I is still think it's it. dumb. And I was like, eh, it's it's kind of... It's a nod to the history of the game. I was kind of into that, but the just, names are my least favorite. They've just part. pushed it so much further, and I'm just like, "All right, we get it." Like, I'm off it. <laughs> anyway, all of our music is produced by DJ James Nasty. All the magic cards are produced by Wizards of the Coast. This podcast is produced by Thinking Really Hard About Magic Cards and Speaking Into Microphones About It. Let's go eat hot dogs. Now I feel like the whole beginning of the episode just really sticks out like a sore thumb. Just make two episodes. <laughs>